We can win this war. We can win this war? OK, well, joining us from Orlando, Florida, is the man in that clip, Anthony Dream Johnson, who says he wants to abolish feminism and make women great again. No, but it also crazy. says, with a trademark, make women great again for women. Always, always great. great. Right. Make women great again. But they're going to do a three-day seminar for women led by all men. <laughs> in mansplaining news, a three-day conference for women led by men hopes to make women great again. How the 22 convention will make you the greatest you ever. Raise your femininity by 500%. First of all, how is a man supposed to tell a woman how to be the ultimate woman? Well, women need to be taught how to be great again. Oh, not my yes, words. We do. Not like my... how to land a husband, <gasps> how to lose weight, how to pop out a bunch of kids. Why do men think they need to fix the problems of women? Well, it says the world's ultimate event for women. Yeah, Orlando, Florida, that's going to be the scene of the crime. It's mansplaining palooza and say no to the toxic, bullying, feminist dogma. <laughs> Taught by men to make women great again. Taking the stage now is the founder of the 22 Convention. You're in for a treat, Mr. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. The first president of the Manosphere. It's run by all men, Surprise. which promises to, quote, make women great again. This course is guaranteed to raise your femininity by 500%. Together, we will make women great again. Excuse me, I'm mansplaining here. She said there's nothing... Boom! Welcome back to the 22 Convention 2022 of Orlando, Florida, being held for the third year in a row at 21 Summit in Orlando. Our next speaker is a returning speaker to 21 Summit, and specifically the 22 Convention. He was actually one of our founding speakers back in 2020, when the world went nuts, you know, moaning and complaining about uh, making women great again. Since then, he's given uh, multiple presentations at our events, including his first year, Make Women Wives Again. Search it, I'll YouTube it, Google it. And last year, he gave a presentation with his wife, Colleen, who's also here in the audience. Both of these videos have done millions of views on YouTube and on TikTok and on the internet, educating millions of women how to be great again and not be uh, degenerate, moral degenerates, bad stuff like that. He's a good friend of mine, a famous YouTuber. He's got over two and a half million fans just on YouTube and hundreds of thousands more on the platforms. Please let me welcome back to the 22 Convention stage, Elliot Hulse. Welcome back. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, man. that helps our daughters become the best women they could possibly be. And so I decided that it would be appropriate for me today to begin our speech about women's empowerment and also bring light to the fact that women's empowerment seems to be a trending topic. It's a popular topic. There are t-shirts everywhere. Uh, no woman would ever argue with the fact that women should be empowered. Most men would agree that it's great for women to have their power. And I say their power because it was only about five years ago that I started watching the videos that were being produced by 21 Summit and Anthony and the many speakers here. And I was enlightened to an idea that was foreign to me with regard to what real female empowerment was. Because if you're anything like me, you grew up in a culture that makes women's empowerment seem a lot more like being men. And so at the time, I had young daughters, and I thought with the, you could say, blue-pilled mindset, and the idea was give them everything they could possibly be to be the best boy they could be, because all of the values and all the virtues that the world promoted for female empowerment was a lot like, you got to be better than the boys. You got to do what the boys do. Anything a boy can do, you can do better. And in fact, it's true for, well, 
one of my daughters when it came to jumping on tables. She was just very gifted with athleticism, and I thought it was so damn cool that she could jump up on tables and sprint and out chin up the boys in her class. That was fine, that was cool, but I also knew it wouldn't last. So let's take a look at true female empowerment. What is it, and listen, I'm not up here preaching as a sense of idealism or from a sense of idealism or what it would be like if we could in a sort of dreamlike state, but from a concerned father's consideration but also application of what can I do as a father to foster an environment for the type of virtue I'm going to describe in our talk today, which is very counter-culture, as you'll see. Speaking of culture, this is the state of women's empowerment today. And so, of course, this is happening where, but on a college campus, so we know where most of these ideas come from. The people that run these institutions seem to have good intentions, but the fruits of their intentions pale in comparison. So why don't we take a look at where women are today? Now, of course, I'm speaking broadly, and there are different women in different states. But generally speaking, if you look across the board, women are dominating, dude, in so many ways. Just a glance at our culture, it seems as if women are running shit. And statistically, you are. Women have higher IQs. Now, this is just what I read on Google, all right? So you might want to do your own research. But recently, it's been shown that women are starting to have higher IQ levels. Women do better in school. Women graduate more than men. Women go to college more than men. Whether that's good or not, we'll debate. Women graduate college. Women go to grad, postgraduate school. More women have become doctors than men starting in 2017. I remember when that statistic first came out. Outside of academia, women are buying more homes. More single women buy homes than men. Women are fulfilling more management roles than men. Women are earning more money than men. As crazy as that may sound, because if you take out the top 1% one, 1 of men who are, you know, the own everything, and you level the playing field in that regard, women are faring far better than men. And uh, I don't have the exact number, but something like 20, per, over the past generation, their increase in wealth has gone up by 20%, and men has dropped by about 5%. And so for any modern man and woman, that sounds like a hell yeah, right? That's amazing. These poor, lowly creatures that have always been shit on and spit on and stepped on and treated so poorly are now winning. Or are they? Women are committing more infanticide than ever before over 60 million abortions of their own babies. Go empowerment. Women are more depressed than ever before. Women are taking more medications than ever before. Women are more single than ever before. And women are creatures of relationship. Why is it that somewhere around 60% of babies are being born out of wedlock? A mother and a child with no husband? Women are raising children on their own and 70 plus percent of prison inmates, inmates come from fatherless homes. We don't need no men, but our boys end up in prison. So it just makes me sort of wonder, well, if I'm going to follow the world's definition of empowerment in order to raise my girls to do great in our culture, Maybe I got to try a different way. Maybe what we've been told about being a great woman in our day isn't really true. But why would anybody lie to you? 
Why would anybody want anything less than the best? I want the best for my daughters. I have a son too, and I want the best for him as well. If I follow the culture, I follow the TV or the screen, or I listen to the people around me, then maybe I should do what the parents of these girls have done. Send them to universities, have them have high degrees, train them to be better than every man that they can come across in the world, get that great job, conquer and create as much as you can out in the world, but don't get married or have any babies. It's only going to slow you down, my daughter. It's interesting because I work with men. That's my demographic, and I've been mentoring men from the time I can remember. And so I come across a lot of really alpha male men in my work, the men that are also mentors to other young men, and they look up to these strong, powerful, patriarchal men. And there's a recurring theme I'm seeing with regard to these men and their daughters. They're raising their daughters to be just like them. Now, I love my children to be like me. But does that mean that she needs to know how to take a punch? That she needs to know how to beat the boys? That she needs to know how to be a man? Well, let's see. How did we get here? So very plain. We got to point out how and who and through what means we got into this diabolical disorientation. It's not by accident. Those who own the screens, those who own the universities, those who own all of our institution, all the institutions of media and education, those who have infiltrated our church, those who basically own our government, highly inspired by these incredible cultural revolters. Revolution. And I want to be tangential, but revolution seems like such a sexy idea, doesn't it? American revolution. Go America. Down to the, or, or down to the patriarchy, or down to the monarchy, spit on the king. We don't need any rules. We don't need any fathers. We don't need any God. Well, as these guys believed. What's all that when we can be free? Someone here mentioned the French Revolution. Wow, we got to destroy all institutions of order so that we can be free. In my investigations as to how we got here, there seems to be a lot of this revolutionary spirit behind it. And it also seems to be the same type of people fomenting these revolutions. Starts with a J, but I won't say. And these guys change their names, so you can't figure them out. So I will begin with 1913, I could get that wrong, in 1813, 1918. The Bolshevik, the Bolshevik Revolution, the Bolshevik Movement, right, which was fomented by those who believed that they needed to topple, well, at that time, Eastern Europe and uh, Russia. And for good reason, I think there was a guy named Ross Putin that kind of got himself into the leadership and was screwing with some czar's head. And so, but there was ample opportunity for them to take his head and then start a revolution that they would hope spread west. Ultimately, the communist revolution, but we've got different names for it today, and it seems to have actually won, but I don't want to go there yet. We call it many different names, one of which comes after the name of one of these dudes, Marx. So it's interesting that Marx was the idea, he was the brain guy, behind much of what we see today. And he had a lot of students, and he has a lot more students today, it seems, than ever before. The university seemed to have embraced his 
ideals all over again. Now, I don't know if it was him or Engels who came first, but the second guy there, Engels, was mixed up with Marx's idea that society, particularly as we know it, is only possible through class struggle. That means that unless there's an oppressed or an oppressor class, then there's no mechanics for what we got going on. And so the will to power, which is a Nietzschean idea, because his ideas are sort of intertwined here somewhat also, is the grand intention of everything we must do. And the only way that that grand intention could unfold is if I think you're better than me. You've been oppressing me. You've been holding me down. You're making my life miserable, and therefore, I must topple you, and we all got to gang up against you. Sounds like hate, but maybe they had good reasons. I'm sure they did. That worked pretty well in Russia because of like Rasputin and the czar and the crazy stuff that was going on there, and people were starving. But they had this sense that they would spread this idea west but it just didn't take. Their idea of a utopian world where everyone was equal, where there was egalitarianism, where no one rose above anyone else, seemed like a good idea, but Western Europe and America just wouldn't buy it. Why? Because of the flourishing middle class. Capitalism. Urgh. Hate that capitalism, middle class. Who wants those people to have an opportunity anyway? Much rather have anger and division. But, you know, capitalism kind of made their plan suck. All these black people are all of a sudden now making money and building businesses? Damn it. How can we get them more angry? Right? Women really have no problem. Now, I got to point out that all of, our all of our educational institutions are run by people who are heavily influenced by these guys' minds. So if some of the things I'm about to say sound crazy, just understand you've been educated by the enemy. I don't trust anything I learned in school. Because I know those textbooks are fruits of these nice guys' work. Women being oppressed. <sighs> I'm not so sure, because if we just take a quick glance into history, we see all types of powerful women all over the place. Queens and monarchs and powerful business women from hundreds of years ago. Not only that, but women have a sort of power no man could ever consider. Women are the ones who actually create culture. Women are the ones that train the minds of the future. Women, when convinced that they're oppressed, gave up that power. Raising your own children. Let these guys raise your children so that you can have real power, which is to get a middle management job. Voting. It's another one. From what I understand, women didn't want to vote. It was something that was, let the guy, let my husband take care of it. But I'll tell you what, her opinion definitely swayed his opinion. What I think the fomenting of disdain or uh, dissatisfaction in women that I think was more of a product of propaganda did was not give a woman a vote, but it canceled the family vote. Because if a family is truly a family, then there should be one set of values. So by giving women this false sense of empowerment because of this false sense of disempowerment, they disempowered the entire civilization. Because now the family is split.
So I got to point out Engels, the guy in the middle there, because he wrote a whole book about the oppressive nature of the family structure. He was convinced, I guess, either that or he was uh, a, a tricker. But he wanted to convince the population, the people, women, that the family structure is an oppressive structure and that they'd be far better off if they got rid of it. So it was through the ideas of these men that contraception came in, abortion came in, all kinds of sterilizing, neutralizing, disengendering practices began to unfold, well, over there, Eastern Europe, Germany. I'm not a historian, but I'm not so sure about the story we're told about Germany either. There's got to be a reason why they were mad. But anyway. So anyway, yeah. I think Berlin was the seat of a lot of that stuff flourishing, and it was just a fucking whorehouse. And the people didn't like it. I don't blame them. But, you know, the whole world's a whorehouse now. Anyway, so the Cultural Revolution, which ultimately led to, in America, something we call the sexual revolution. Flower power. How many of us have parents that were raised in the 60s? Boy, what a shit show. Most of them don't even live with their spouse, or I don't know what's going on with the, that generation anyway. But so the sexual revolution. So that brought us a level of, gosh, it always kind of sounds bad, but freedom, but chaos. I was trying to explain to my daughter the other day the importance of boundaries. And I had to use the example of a musician. If a musician is going to create beautiful music, he's got to discipline himself. He's got to learn the instrument. Right? Charlie Parker, by the way, is his quote. Well, he's got to learn the instrument. That means you've got, to, you've got to be disciplined. You can't just do whatever you want. Learn the instrument. Then you've got, to, you've got to learn the notes. You've got to study those notes. And you've got to pay very close attention to where each one of those notes go because if something's out of order, the whole thing's going to be messed up. You need those boundaries. You've got to pay attention. But if you want to be free as a musician and you forget all that stuff, you're going to make lousy music. The sexual revolution unbound the most powerful music that a human could make, which happens through the sexual act, and turned it into ugly music. And it's totally against the natural law, so we had to use technology to allow it to happen. I listened to a talk the other day with a man who quoted another man, and I'm not so smart as to remember every man's name, but he said that when we legalize contraception, homosexual marriage is right behind it. It's coming right next. And unfortunately, he got to die right before 2015, I think it was, when homosexual marriage became the law of the land. Chaos is the law of the land. So the sexual revolution uh, is not necessarily a good thing. Because when you don't have boundaries around something amazing, you create shitty music. And we're living in the fruits of a society that plays shitty music, literally and metaphorically. So enough blaming these guys. We're really the ones to blame because we bit their bait hook, line, and sinker. Most Gen Zers and millennials think communism's a good idea. We are living in a time that's so wrought with sin that we're proud of it. You know, we had this conversation at lunch about contraception mainly, but sin in general. And I surmise that there was a time that when we did live in sin, at least there was a sense of guilt. No, this is not right. And you know what we had? The confessional. I repent.
But now it seems as if those who are living with virtue are the ones that have to repent to those who are steeped in sin because sin is the law of the land. It's where we are. So, okay. I don't want to blame Protestantism. I do, but I don't. Because from what I understand, Martin Luther was a devout Catholic. And he held very many strong Catholic traditions. He threw out some of the baby with the bathwater, but perhaps for good reason. But what he did do is, well, basically what you see what I'm doing here is I'm stepping back. So even before the Protestant Revolution, even before the Bolshevik Revolution, a lot of this stuff was going on. So Western civilization, let me give you a backdrop. Western civilization is founded on Christendom. All the beauty, all the art, all the architecture, all the music, all the amazing, beautiful shit that you see when you go to Europe is Catholic. This, that's the ethos from which Western civilization was born. And of course, where there's power, there could be corruption. There's no question about it. And there's no question that there was some corruption. But to reject the order, to reject the foundation, to reject the graces from which your society flourished and flowered opens the door for revolution. And so we find ourselves here today in a society that's post-Christian, post-Catholic, and this guy, even though he was a devout Catholic, and you'll see where my talk is going, had a strong devotion to the most powerful woman who ever lived, who carries their greatest virtue, Mary, kind of kicked it in its ass because he wanted to have many wives. And so as a means by which he wanted to exert his power as a man, he wanted to create ultimately what is chaos, is the destruction of the order of a society by saying, I reject authority, hierarchy, I become my own hierarchy, my own authority, and I'm gonna marry as many women as I want. So I'm not, listen, not, not, not trying to sow division. I only just reverted to being a Catholic about four years ago. I'm learning this stuff now. And maybe it was because of my childhood or my infant baptism that maybe I have a sense that I need to defend it. But I like to dig into history. I like to figure out why. I, confirmation bias, don't get me wrong. I'm not a perfect man. But the deeper I dig, the more I look, the more I realize that the babies that were thrown out with the bathwater during this revolution started a thousand years before the Bolshevik Revolution, is where we could trace, I believe, where we could trace the foundation of modern feminism. How is that so? How is it that modern feminism is a fruit of the Protestant Re Reformation? Well, I'll tell you. Because one of the ways that the baby was thrown out with the bathwater was with the desecration of the feminine image the perfect feminine image, the Virgin Mother Mary, Mother of God. I struggled for a while, but it didn't take me too long because I realized if I need an icon for my daughters, I need an image for my daughters, I need an example for my daughters that they can relate to, maybe Mary's a good idea. So I gave her a chance because even being Catholic, I grew up in a revolutionary world and one that rejects tradition and Mary is the face of Catholic tradition. I don't really even believe that most people who have such vitriol towards Mary, when you bring up her name, you need a lot of courage, I think that's why God chose me, to even say her name. It's a hatred towards order, it's a hatred of Western civilization, it's a rejection of Christendom and ultimately a rejection of Christ. 
So the desecration of the perfect feminine image, which was always an icon for women to hold themselves to, to look towards as a, as a, as a noble example for what they could be, is got to be a fruit of Satan. If you hate the flesh that Christ was clothed in, or you get such a vitriol or hate or angst in your body when she's mentioned, which by the way, nobody worships Mary. And I have something to say about quote unquote idols too. If an image of a woman who holds high regard in your heart as she should, because she is the mother of God, she is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. She is the sinless, immaculate conception. But I have a picture of my grandmother, who's a great woman in my house. I can have a picture of my deceased relatives who I love, and I look at their picture, and I think about them. Well, then that's idolatry, too. I don't, I don't mean to go down this rabbit hole, but this is the, this is the uh, weapon by which those who hate the perfect image of the woman use as a means for desecrating her image. So I gotta be selfish here for a moment. I'm gonna go back. All theological stuff aside, all religious stuff aside, I'm not a theologian, but I've always been called by God. I'm a religious man, always have been dabbled around a whole lot. But I find myself here. In fact, God called me here through the graces of my infant baptism. But just being practical, right? I have this conversation with quote unquote atheists and I just say, listen, could it just be a good idea? Like, wouldn't it be helpful if we had a sense of guilt about our sin and then the world would be a better place? Wouldn't it be helpful to think that when you die, you're gonna be held accountable at a judgment for the dumb shit you did? Wouldn't you imagine that if you knew there was gonna be a punishment for the bad stuff you're doing, you'd probably do less, or at least the other people would? So for me, religion, of course, I'm called in my heart, I'm an emotional guy. But at the same time, it's practical. We had two speakers come up today that admitted they're not religious people but damn sure wouldn't eschew religious value. It was, it was Richard Grannon, which was so funny to watch him wrestle on the stage, who's saying like, I, I'm not a religious person, but we need God. I'm not a religious person, but because it just makes sense. <laughs> it's practical, it's logical. We suffer without God. But the same with Mary, we suffer without Mary because wouldn't you say it's a practical idea for both men and women to not just have the image of the perfect man, which, by the way, Mary only elevates Christ. She doesn't take his place. She brings Christ to us. Nobody loves Christ more than his mother. And nobody, none of you, none of me, none of us could love his mother more than Christ did. We can't love her enough. Christ will just, I still loved her more. We can't love Mary enough. But anyway, isn't it a good idea that there's not only the image of the perfect man in Christ, it's good. And I don't want to make anybody believe that I think that it's, you need anything else. We do. He is the lamb that, that brings salvation to the world, right? It's him. It's Christ. It's all about him. It's the son. He gives us life, but Mary gave him Christ life. Anyway, isn't it a good idea to have an image of the perfect woman, the immaculate woman, the virgin most powerful for men to say, you know what, if I'm looking for a wife, I think I want one like this. Not only do I think it's a good idea for me to have one like this, but if I were God, let me be so pretentious. 
if I were going to come down to earth, I need a portal. I'm going to get down there because I got a message for those guys. I got to take on flesh. I'm going to create a portal. I am going to create the perfect woman to come through. Now, why would God choose a less than perfect woman? No, not choose. Why would he create a less than perfect woman to come through? Is God so silly, so illogical, that he's going to create what some people say, a mere woman like you and I? There's nothing special about her. That's what I hear. God married her. That's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. And we also know it's biblical because when the angel comes to her, which, by the way, Christ comes through the angelic salutation. There's no Christ if an angel doesn't come to a virgin and say, Hail Mary, you're full of grace. He didn't say, Hail Mary, you're pretty good. He didn't say, Hail Mary, you got some grace. He said, Hail Mary, you are full of grace. I want a wife that's as close to that as possible, fellas. But if you don't know Mary, you have no image. You have no uh, example. But I didn't even start there. That's not where I began. I began with, well, what kind of image, what kind of example, not the pop culture shit, not Nicki Minaj, not uh, Sex in the City Girls, but I know they don't watch that shit anymore. It's mostly on Netflix. What examples are there for me to venerate in my home for my daughters to emulate? Uh, who? Jackie O. Kennedy or uh, Queen of England or uh, Hillary Clinton or... Who? Madonna? That's so funny. Madonna. You can see how they invert and pervert things. Who? 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 There are lots of good women out there, right? Right? Who, then? And I'm really thinking, if you guys could think with me, that'd be helpful, but I'm not sure there are any. Now, I know that as a man, and as a woman, it's true, too, it's always good to emulate Christ, perfect man. I'm not a woman, but if I was one and I have a lot of empathy because of my daughters, I think I might want a female example to follow. Well, once again, I don't want to, I'm not knocking these guys, but I think it was one of his heirs that went around smashing images of the perfect woman. I'm not so sure I'm too happy about that. I'm not so sure I'm too happy about the fact that we almost, I almost, and mind you, I'm not a great Catholic, just figuring this stuff out. I'm not so sure it's a good idea that we have sort of a, you know, we say antichrist. And I think a lot of people understand that. And there are different opinions, but. The Antichrist might be a guy, I'm sure, but there's definitely an Antichrist spirit. I know I had it. Where you say the name Jesus and you kind of cringe. That's for everyone. I don't know how that happened to me. But it was there. I recognized it. Even when I started to become Christian, I was like, Jesus. Ugh. It's diabolical. That's all I can say. I've had to grow accustomed to saying his name. There's power in the name. But if you say Mary, <laughs> you might get whipped worse by Christians. I made a post on my Facebook yesterday about the fact that I'd be coming here, and I'm going to talk about Mary. We live in an anti-Mary world. There's an anti-Mary spirit in our world. No wonder feminism reigns. How could there be such anger? I, Lord, have mercy on me. Trying my best. I think I'm doing okay with being objective and forgiving of people. They're confused. You know, maybe not 
I don't want to say they're bad people, they're not. But with such confusion about what's so beautiful and what's so virtuous and what's so holy and divine in the feminine. Oh, I do remember. You know what we do, women do? I know you guys know that Nicki Minaj is trash. Pagan wa uh, goddess worship, that's what has replaced Mary. <laughs> Pagan goddess worship, goddess. And I see these women on Instagram, they float around like they're a goddess. I'm a goddess, most of them are whores, by the way. And, but they're goddesses because I have flowers and I have dangly things and I have paintings on my body. Usually they have tattoos everywhere. They're goddesses. They've become goddesses themselves and they're invoking like Greek goddesses or something like that. It's wacky, it's weird, but like one of our speakers said that if we don't have a god, we become our own gods. So it's a form of narcissism. But we don't have the mother of God, virgin most powerful. And of course I like that name because the virtue I want to instill in my daughters. I gotta be honest. Virgin most powerful. I am I try not to be so nostalgic about times past. Here's a tendency to do that. I do it. I wasn't around, so I think highly of it. But I can't help but to think that there had to be a time, it's recorded, that there was virtue in purity. Like now, if you're a virgin, there's something wrong with you. But prior to the sexual revolution, the cultural revolution, the Marxists we saw before, was that so? I'm not so sure. I think there was a time when there was value and valor and virtue in virginity. Well, we know it because the icon of our perfect example in a woman says so. I don't think it was a mistake. And I do believe in a perpetual virginity. So I thought it would be fun to just kind of rattle off a few of the names of this most powerful woman, which I'll show you in a moment, has inspired men more than any big boo blonde broad could ever. More men have created art and beauty and cathedrals and music and poetry and all the amazing things that women crave. Why don't they give me stuff? because of her virtue, and all of her names beckon to her virtue. Not her big boobs, in fact, she's very modest. Not her short skirt, not her master's degree, not her big paycheck, her BMW, her extroverted verboseness that gets all of the attention that she would ever want, or posting on Instagram so you can get a bunch of thumbs up and DMs, but from virtue. And look, it's not just women. This is a talk about women, so I'm talking about women. But virtue seems to be vomited on today. So anyway, I chose this picture because I love it so much. She seems so approachable. She was a human. There's no question about it. I'm not saying she's divine. She's not. She was a creation, the most perfect creation, but a creation. Jesus was begotten. Took me a while to figure out what that meant. Not created, begotten. She was created. Begotten means he was always here. He was always here, he just showed up. Well, he didn't just show up. Came through her based on what? An angel visiting her and whispering that angelic salutation. And you know what that made her? This is, I just can't, you can't refute her value when you, Pay attention to her titles, one of which is Spouse of the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christian, you probably believe that when a man and a woman come together in marriage, they become one flesh. It's a mystery, is what Paul says. You become one flesh, meaning, among many things, that you're like you know each other really, really well. My wife and I have been together going on 100 years. Call her my old lady. <laughs> a 
We know each other pretty damn well. We can finish each other's sentences. We know what each other's are thinking. We can feel each other's vibes. We're like one thing. Is this any old ordinary woman? Or is she one thing with God? Like there's no division. Like she's the spouse of the third person of the Holy Trinity. And so if anybody has any problems or any hangups about who Mary is, don't forget she's one flesh and brought the flesh of God into the world. I think we should pay more attention to her. So anyway, uh, this isn't the greatest list, but I have a few here that I think are really awesome because it tells, now Catholics do this, man. There's like, and when I say Catholics, I'm talking Orthodox. I'm talking Christians from the apostolic age, first Christians, the way things were done for 1500 years until some revolutionaries got involved. If you're a Christian and you reject tradition, of 1,500 years, meaning prior to the revolution, you might want to just check back a little bit because the baby left with the bathwater. One of the things that the reformers did was totally sterilize the faith and left us with solo scriptura, but that's a weird one too. Solo scriptura? Where does it say in the Bible, Bible only? And who gave us the Bible? It didn't fall out of the sky. Just to alert you, the Bible didn't fall out of the sky. The Catholic Church gave us the Bible. So you probably have to throw out the Bible too. But anyway, that makes too much sense. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Can you argue with that? You can't believe in Jesus and say she ain't the Mother of God. Holy Virgins of Virgins, Mother of Christ, Mother of the Divine Grace, Mother Most Pure. Oh, Mother Most Chaste, Mother Most undefiled, mother most admirable, virgin most faithful, virgin most merciful, virgin most venerable, mother of the Savior, seat of wisdom, cause of our joy, spiritual vessel, ark of the covenant. She is the ark of the covenant. What was the ark of the covenant? It was where God was to be found in the Old Testament. Where do we find God but inside that ark? Virgin most powerful. I'll give you one more. The New Eve. It almost seems as if the Old Testament and the New Testament sort of mirror each other. Wouldn't you say? I'm not a scholar, but I think this. And I watch a lot of YouTube videos. And so if grace was lost through a woman... There was no question about it. Michael did a great job explaining it. Yeah. It was lost to a woman, but the man let it happen. Don't listen to your wife. It was lost to a woman. Wouldn't it make sense that it was then found by a woman? Don't you think it would make sense that if it was lost, you know, they say the alpha and the omega, this sort of cyclical thing that happens. If it was lost here, it'll be found here too. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. I don't need to convince you, it's a fact. It's through her. So anyway, those are some of the names of Mary. And all of her names point to her virtue. That's what is my call to action. My call here is back to traditional virtue, not virtue signaling virtue, not social justice virtue, but divine justice virtue. We need religion. We need God. We need Christ. We need Mary. So just to kind of show you the type of veneration or love. Women, if you want love, if you want real love, if you want to see what the manifestation of real love from a man looks like, it's in the gifts he can bring you. The home that you live in, the clothes that you wear, the food on your table. Man, it's, it's our desire to love you by giving you stuff. That's why when you're strong and independent, we're turned off. I can't buy this woman anything. She's got more money than me. It's ugly. But when we can come to you, even with our meager gifts, you get to receive it, but that gives us joy. This woman, 
No woman on the face of the earth has more depictions of her by brilliant artists than Mary. Brilliant, loving men painting after painting after painting after painting. Wouldn't you love to be a woman like that? But hey, you got Instagram and you got your selfie stick, so you're good, right? Cathedrals, in veneration of a woman, comes these grand structures, Notre Dame. If you want gifts from a man, you want love from a man, you want the pouring out of all that's good that a man wants to give you, could you imagine emulating anyone better than the one that this is built for? No. By the way, where I'm listening to an audio book about Mary, of course, and the author's talking about how there really is no great, beautiful, religious Jewish art. There's art, but there's no great, beautiful, religious art. There's no great, beautiful, Protestant art. That doesn't exist. Now, there are artists that are Protestants, but there's no Protestant art. There's no great, beautiful Muslim art. There are Muslim artists, but like this, and for what? A woman. It is as strange as it sounds because we live in a world that smashed the patriarchy happy. It was Christ through Mary that elevated the status of women worldwide. It's Christianity that rose women up to such a degree that men would create such amazing things out of love for a woman. But the author also said that, well, number one, where there's Mary, there's flourishing culture. Where there's Mary, there's victories in battle. You'd be amazed. Look up the Battle of Lepanto. We'd be living under Sharia law if it wasn't for the rosary. There's victory in battle. There's flourishing of culture and education. Matter, mother, material blessings, Mary, ma, mother. She infuses culture and material with beauty, Catholic beauty. Because Catholics venerate Mary. Orthodox do too, kind of the same in a way. But when you threw the baby out with the bathwater, you got ugliness. They're not beautiful. This is beautiful. You need Mary. So we had Columbus Day. Now you notice that when uh, revolutionaries want to destroy stuff, what do they do? They get rid of, the, they smash statues, right? And they always think they're doing a great job, you know, smashing Mary statues is no different than what happened during the pandemic when they're smashing the Abraham Lincoln statues. So when you want to destroy a culture, you destroy their heritage, you destroy their tradition. And so of course, Columbus Day is now like indigenous Duke bag day or something. I don't know what the hell it is. We, we, we venerate the savages that lost because this Catholic man was so bad. I'm grateful for him, and he was grateful for Mary, so much so that he named his ship the Santa Maria. Mary set foot on the new land. And, and she did it in, in, in a myriad of different ways because Catholics believe that Revelation, Revelation history did not end. It'd be a shame if Revelation history just ended. God never leaves us. Mary appears at various times throughout history in what Catholics call apparitions. But anyway, it was Mary literally in Guadalupe who had the biggest conversion of people in the world, Central and South America. And it wasn't at the end of a sword, it was inspiration for a woman. Look up to Our Lady of Guadalupe. She came on that ship. Maria, Santa Maria, and the Nina, the little girl. Wouldn't you want to be that kind of woman? 
that inspires that in a man rather than being a slut? You can inspire a hard dick, but that's not too hard to do. In fact, robots can place, replace you. But a woman that inspires this, I, I'd want to learn more about her, wouldn't you? These are some of the apparitions of Mary. So basically, like I said before, there have over the past, uh, I don't want to say like 500 years or something, I'm getting these numbers wrong, but there have been something like over 2,000 apparitions of Mary, meaning Mary shows up to someone in a piece of toast or something. There, it just happens all the time and it's weird. Half of it is garbage, but there are 15 approved apparitions of Mary, meaning that Mary came to these people and had a message for them and Everyone said, you're crazy, you're nuts, we don't believe you, but we're going to investigate. That's what the Catholic Church does. Investigate. It says, oh, so you came to these three little children in uh, Fatima, Portugal? We don't believe you. And they do lengthy investigations. Do you know that the name, the word devil's advocate? Yeah, this is devil's advocate. You know where it comes from? Scrutiny about these uh, apparitions. Meaning they hire someone, an investigator, whose only job is to prove it wrong. He's called the devil's advocate. So we got a devil's advocate that prove, said, hey, look, there's no question this happened. Plus the secular newspapers, I'm talking about this one over on the right, they, there were those who saw it happen. Look up the miracle of the sun in Fatima. Not, same year as the Bolshevik Revolution, by the way. Night, I'm going to get it wrong, 1913 or, or, or 17 or 18, something like that. 19 teen. You can see I'm not a scholar. I'm just a meathead with a pointer. So it's interesting, though. So in this apparition, they call it Lady of Good Success. Mary, this was about 500 years ago in um, South America somewhere. Does that make sense? Maybe not. But it was a long time ago. And she predicted the world that we live in today. Some of the things that she said, among others, is that there will be no purity left amongst children. Children will be turned against their parents. Um, just a lot of things like feminism is going to reign. She talked about Freemasons before Freemasonry was a thing. And regardless of your opinion of them or the Jays, they don't like their names being called out, mm, they pull the strings of evil in our world today. Look it up. So she predicted that. And she had a remedy. She always has a remedy. She never comes without hope. She says, look, if you guys don't do what I say, which is basically, every time she says do something that I say, she's saying to appease my son. It's always through Mary to Jesus. Mary never stands on her own. Here, here, and here, she gives the same advice. Now, comes with a lot of different things, but there's one element that's always present. And that is to pray the rosary. Whoa, okay. That opens up a whole new can of worms and a whole lot of misunderstanding and hatred and vitriol and diabolical disillusion about what the rosary is. Now the word rosary comes from rose, which was adopted at some point in terms of venerating Mary. Now, once I said, like I said before, Catholics don't, don't, don't worship Mary. In fact, you know, they had such a desire to distinguish the difference between the veneration of a saint, which all Christians from the dawn of Christianity recited or believed in the tenets of the Apostles' Creed, one of which is, I believe, in the communion of saints. But there's just been such a debate and such clarity needed to be. Now, you don't think that Catholics are just so dumb that they're like, oh, we're going to worship Mary. There's a lot of thought go, gone into this and a lot of explanation as to what's really going on here. Dulia versus Letria. Letria is the worship only reserved for God. That's it. Nobody gets Letria, the type of divine worship. But Dulia is communion with the saints, Mary being the top saint. Now, what is the rosary? She asks us to pray the rosary. She tells the little children of Fatima, pray the rosary. She tells St. Dominic, pray the rosary. At the Battle of the Monto, she said, pray the rosary. Well, what is the rosary? If I could just boil it down to this, it's the Bible on beads. Now, most people don't understand that, they didn't know that. 
If I say that to people, they'll say, well, what are you talking about? The, the rosary is centered completely around the life, the birth, life, and resurrection, or death of Jesus. His birth, his life, his death, and his, resur and his resurrection. It's totally Jesus-centric. Each decade of the rosary, I got one here. I'm going to teach you how to pray the rosary real quick. Now, we're not going to do it because it takes about half an hour to get through it, but I want you to understand what it is because Mary calls this, along with many of the other saints, the weapon, the spiritual weapon. It's a litany of prayers. That's all it is. A litany of prayers, one of which is the Hail Mary, which is totally biblical. Every aspect of the Hail Mary, I'll get to it in a moment because there's so many different parts, is biblical. It's just basically reciting bits of the Bible. Hail Mary, full of grace. Who said that? The angel. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Elizabeth told her that when she went to go visit. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Well, that's biblical too. Can't remember where. Pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. And so, communion with saints, we're told to pray for each other. Anyway, you could do your own research. So, the cross is the Apostles' Creed. There are five Our Fathers, and then there are five decades of Hail Marys. Now, here's the thing. When you pray the Hail Mary with each one of these, you're meditating on one of the mysteries of Christ. There's a lot going on here. It's pretty complex, but pretty damn amazing. Pretty powerful, too, and there are a lot of promises associated with praying this litany of prayers. It's like a bouquet of prayers. But here's why I think this is important with regard to my talk and the things that we're explaining and, 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 and uh, discussing here at this event. Each one of the mysteries that you meditate on with each decade of the rosary, you're meditating on one of the virtues of Mary or Christ. Now the first series is called the Joyful Mysteries. You go around one time, it's called the Joyful Mysteries. The Joyful Mysteries are centered around how Christ got here. The first of the Joyful Mysteries is the Annunciation. So we pray while meditating on the angelic salutation, Hail Mary. Christ came to the world through that. Now, in order for Christ to make his way through Mary in that instance, there must have been a virtue. And that virtue is humility. And if we're going to combat feminism, there must be a focus on humility. Wouldn't you agree? So I can see how praying the rosary would combat feminism if women prayed with their mind meditating on humility. Mary had to be humble. The second decade in the Joyful Mysteries is the visitation. She goes after she discovers that she's pregnant and finds out also that her cousin, old woman, who was not supposed to have any babies, was pregnant too. She runs off to go help her instead of, you know, what we do now. You lay around and take care of myself. I can't do anything. I'm pregnant. Well, she goes off and she helps her cousin. Charity. Would it not be good to meditate on the virtue of charity, meaning love of the other as other, honoring the other even though I might not get something in return? There's a sort of natural solipsism to women, right? I think, it's, I think it makes sense, but solipsism essentially means self-focus. And it makes sense that a woman would be naturally solipsistic because, well, she's got to protect herself and her baby. So God kind of puts that in there. But in order to sort of root it out when it's not really necessary, a strong sense of charity and focus on that virtue might be a good idea. The third set is the nativity. This is when, in her lowly state, she finds place in a poor place away from home amongst animals in a barn and gives birth to the 
Son of God. Poverty. Poverty, that's a tough one, right? Like, do I really want to be poor? But if you really think about it, it's a matter of detachment. Simplicity is a way I'd like to describe it. Would we, would women not be more like Mary and combating feminism if there was a sense of simplicity in your life? And then the fourth is the presentation at the temple. She is pious. She is obedient. She brings her baby, even though maybe she doesn't understand, but I'm pretty sure she did. She did what she was supposed to do. And that is obedience. Maybe sometimes our own will isn't what's important, but doing the right thing. Would that not be helpful to meditate on? And then the final one, the final decade is losing and then finding Jesus in the temple. And that mystery, I think, is really associated with purpose and mission. And not only a sense of purpose and mission for herself, but the detachment as a mother from your children to allow them to be unencumbered by your fear for them to live their mission in life. She was afraid. She lost her son, who she was entrusted with by the Holy Spirit. She's freaking out. But she realized, I have to let go. Would it not be good to have a sense of detachment towards your children rather than making your children the God of your life? So that's it. That's all. That's my talk for y'all. And I hope you guys enjoyed that. I would encourage you, if you know nothing about Mary, but you want to combat feminism, check her out. She's pretty cool. Done. <laughs> Any questions? I got a minute and a half, 90 seconds. No. OK, cool. Thank you, guys. Oh, 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 yes, do. Of course you do. I remember you from every year I'm here. Now you got your yeah. dog. <laughs> Where's your husband? Uh, he's in. Oh, he's here too. I remember meeting him. He's, as well. a, he's over there. Um, I just, did you say five decades? Of yeah. So if you look at it here, it's broken up. There's an there's a Our Father in between each one. And so you got one, two, three, four, five. Okay, and, and all the ones in between are Hail Mary? The ones in between are our fathers. So beads actually began as Paternoster beads. So a lot of people think that these beads came out of Satan's ass or something. But in fact, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. But in fact, what the Desert Fathers and the early Christians would do is they would have rocks in their pockets. Yeah. And they would pray by switching the rocks from one pocket to the other. And they would, so it was that in the beginning, they would pray the entire... Psalms of King David and they memorized them, but most people couldn't read and so it became difficult to teach people how to pray this rocks in the pocket uh, Psalter um, So then they started saying well just pray the Our Father And so that they would pray 150 Our Fathers because there were 150 Psalms and they would go from pocket to pocket But you can just imagine walking around with all these pockets so that St. Anthony the Great Decided well, why don't we string some beads and we'll create Paternoster beads our father beads. And then as Marian devotion began to flourish in like the 13th, uh, 12th, 13th century, they began just turning it into a litany of different prayers. So you got about six different prayers in here. Okay. Well, I'm not a Catholic. I'm a Baptist Method Catholic Hostel with Messianic Jewish leanings, so you can't put me in a box. I'm just a believer. And um, that was very interesting. I learned some stuff I didn't know. And thank you. Thank you. We can win this war. We can win this war? OK, well, joining us from Orlando, Florida, is the man in that clip, Anthony Dream Johnson, who says he wants to abolish feminism and make women great again. No, but it also crazy. says, with a trademark, make women great again. Full women, always, always great. great. Right. Make women great again. But they're going to do a three-day seminar for women led by all men. 
<laughs> In mansplaining news, a three-day conference for women led by men hopes to make women great again. How the 22 convention will make you the greatest you ever. Raise your femininity by 500%. First of all, how is a man supposed to tell a woman how to be the ultimate woman? But women need to be taught how to be great again. Oh, not my yes, words. We do. Like my... how to land a husband, <gasps> how to lose weight, how to pop out a bunch of kids. Why do men think they need to fix the problems of women? Well, it says the world's ultimate event for women. In Orlando, Florida, that's going to be the scene of the crime. It's mansplaining palooza and say no to the toxic bullying feminist dogma. <laughs> Taught by men to make women great again. Taking the stage now is the founder of the 22 Convention. You're in for a treat, Mr. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. The first president of the manosphere. It's run by all men, Surprise. which promises to, quote, make women great again. This course is guaranteed to raise your femininity by 500%. Together, we will make women great again. Excuse me, I'm mansplaining here. She said there's nothing...